And we're live again on this Thursday, uh, pre-Memorial Day weekend. I, I will say that too. And uh, we welcome everybody to the show. I'm Tom Tynan. I answer your home improvement questions, mainly on Sports Radio 610 in the Houston area every Saturday and Sunday, Saturdays 9 to 12, and Sundays 8 to 11. Been on the air answering people's home improvement questions in Houston since 1987, October of 1987, the 6th to be exact, if I remember correct, and I'm very old now. But it's been a great run, and the run is still happening. So you can listen to me every weekend. And before me on Saturday, we've got a great lineup of the gardening experts. I am not a gardening expert. I listen to their show. I am an amateur. You'll get more out of it than I will because you'll be able to listen to the whole thing and won't have to do any show prep like I have to do before I go on because they're on before me from 7 until 9 on Saturday. So make sure you tune them in too and visit both our websites. We have a lot of great information and people and contacts and, and people that can help you with all of your gardening and home improvements in the Houston area. And of course, the man behind the curtain who is the brains of the operation that's just come out right now is Charlie Mosier. Hello, Charlie. Hello, Tom. Yeah, yes. the, uh, the Garden Pros. In fact, I love that Garden Pro show. I do too. I know I, you I do. I love that show because <laughs> my house is very quiet on Saturday mornings when Sandy goes and hosts it. Um, and I love. Are we going to start on Sunday morning next? <laughs> I thought you get two days. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I don't think so. No, Sunday morning's my show. Remember? Anyway, <laughs> so, yeah. But uh, no, she's she's been doing great. In fact, the host of that show bought me birthday dinner last night, which was kind of nice. So there you go. Yes, and Charlie and I for the next twenty eight or so days, sixty days. I don't know what it is. Till August 14th, we're both the same age. We're both 63. Then I turned 64. And we'll find out if we still love him when he's 64. <laughs> yeah, after I get older. <laughs> okay. So what we're going to do today, we're going to answer questions that you send us at homeshowradio.com using that there Ask Tom button on the page. And you fill it out, send in the form and do that. And of course, you are, of course, welcome to send us questions by using the comment section here on YouTube. You go in uh, where it says comments, just fill that out and then click enter and we'll get that question here and we can answer it for you. And that's what we're here to do is to help you make your home more energy efficient, more, uh, more friendly for you and um, save its value. Keep it, keep that house worth what, what it should be worth um, for as long as you're living in it. Fair enough. Maintain your home. Don't let things stay broken. That's exactly right. So you don't want to live in a broken home. No, so. only just for a crooked man with a crooked leg kind of thing. I don't know what it was. Yeah, something like crooked that. Right. Crooked head. That was a long time ago. Let's get to the questions. Here's the first okay. one we have, Tom. First one comes from Bob in Tanglewood. He says, I'm looking at a rural piece of property, about five or 10 acres, on which to build a combination residence and very small business. I know nothing about zoning and would like to Whoops. know what restrictions are placed on and what can be built on a piece of property i'd like the property to be within 100 miles of houston i prefer building an off grid as much as possible oh where did tom go well hell's bells we lost tom i know he's coming back hang on a second i think he 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 somehow there was a tremor in the force and we've got him back am i back am i back am i back i don't know what happened i don't either I'm not even down in Brownsville. I don't know what happens. I'm yeah, on AT and T five G. They tell me. <laughs> five. Well, there you go. Well, it's. Did you hear Bob's question? By the way, you want me to repeat? I it did for you? not. It just went right when you started the question. So, really, can we? Yeah. I started I'm, talking. I got. I started talking, and you saw that. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. Okay. I was more concerned about connecting back, but okay. All right. So here's the deal. Yeah. Just no, so you yeah. know. Tom and I, I'm here at the office where, you know, the studios and everything are where yeah. Tom's show originates on the weekend. Tom does it from his house up up in uh, Huntwick, is it? Up in Champions Forest I'm area? In North Houston. Yes, I am. Or in, in Brownsville. So he likes to live at both extremes. And uh, he's... Yeah. And so, but and so we connect by this computer thing and then we send the show out to you. So that's pretty cool. And um, I'm checking all my wires and everything seems don't, copacetic. Don't, don't, so. don't touch anything. I didn't um, do <laughs> You've done enough already. Um, so, so Bob, bottom line is Bob's looking to buy some rural property, five to 10 acres, um, yes. where he's going to put a house and maybe a small business. He knows nothing about zoning. He wants to know, Tom, what are the restrictions uh, placed when, and when you, what can be built on a piece of property? He wants something about a hundred miles within, you know, the Houston I got area. it. 
Okay. Don't have to repeat anymore. Zoning in Texas. Hmm. Some cities have it. Most don't. Houston, zero. And there's no way. Houston got so big so fast, they could do pretty much anything you wanted. You could put up a gas station. You could put up a house next to it. And it was just boom. It just grew. So zoning didn't exist in Houston for so long, they can't bring it in now. It's too late. When I first got here from Florida, which is zoned up the gazoo, uh, I was very surprised being an architect and going, there's no zoning. Then so what they did was they created homeowners associations and created pockets where they had their own zoning in their own wall area. It doesn't have to have a physical wall, but just a per, uh, perimeter around the area. And that's how Houston is. Now, if there's no zoning and in the counties there aren't, you can have, unless somebody in your area says you can't, and you can always call the local county and they're going to say, we don't care. Uh, you can have a gas station up front and you can have your house behind. It's not going to make any difference. You're not going to find zoning in many cities. I think Austin probably has a little, maybe, I've never built there. And I'm thinking the Dallas area and maybe Fort Worth, but I don't think Fort Worth. I think you'll find it in the Dallas area probably one of the only two in the whole area that's going to have any kind of true zoning, but they will have pockets that they re redo a little bit, but it's not much of a worry. And if you're a hundred miles out and you're in a County, I think you're going to find zero zoning restrictions. I think you'll be able to do whatever you want. Yeah. We bought property up in one of those uh, acreage estate yes, kind of did. places up, up in new Waverly. Yep. And um, it doesn't have an HOA. It has a POA. The true, you're true. Yeah. Is there, is there a big difference between those? I don't know. And you'd have to get, I'm sure attorney wise there is. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you went in there, they said, this is the only kind of type of buildings we allow. I'm sure they allow things like uh, outbuildings where a lot of homeowners associations won't and restrictions. You can't see it from the street, but you're living on 20 mm -hmm. acres. You have no street that people are going to see. So I have a feeling three acres, it'll feel like 20 because you got three acres on either side. So now yeah. we're talking, you know, nine acres, so it gets bigger. Uh, so you'll have to look at the, uh, the description, but it's probably mm -hmm. because it's out in the rural area and not in a city. But one way or the other, it's still an association that has their restrictions. And usually when you go out and you buy, you know, 20 acres or 30 acres, if you want to put a mechanic shop on there and nobody, there's nothing written that says you can't, I'm sure you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, where we live, where well, where we live, the, where we own, um, the um, and it backs right up to the national forest. That's the thing I liked yes. about my land. Literally, the back my back property line has signs about every fifty feet that says national forest. And so, anybody who knows anything probably figured out where we bought. But anyway, the the <laughs> the, 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 the nice forest actually. Yeah. Yeah, because there's part you could have the state forest. I thought eh, state forest is a little more variable. I like the national forest. Um, in any event, the um, long and short of it is the reason we bought there was for the protection of the POA and the fact that it had mm -hmm. a road, that it had power, that it had high speed mm -hmm. internet, you know, and, and those important. things. And when people look at buying these properties, Tom, you know, we looked at another acreage opportunity as well for about the same money for about 10 times more acres. But the problem was we were going to have to cut in a road. And you you know what it costs to cut in a road. You know, you know we're going to have to run power in there. You know, we're going to have to do all this stuff. And none of that is cheap. And I, it's I so think, funny. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I was just because no, I, I was just going to expand on it and just say, you know, and then, you know, how are you going to get water in there? You're going to drill a well. Hopefully you hit water, you know, and all this stuff. It's. It's a, to me, it, there's a lot that's left out there uh, when you when you out, go out and buy property that that if you live in Tanglewood, you probably don't think about. Well, and people used to come to my company and say, we we bought we just bought uh, 50 acres and we want to build just a little simple home. You know, we're going to live out there. And, you know, I see them in town for so many dollars a square foot. And when they say we want to build out there, then I have to go through the the utility hookups. We have to build a temporary construction road first in case it rains. Then you have to go in and have a permanent road put into your property, to your house. And then uh, you have to have, like you're saying, you have to drill a well. Do you go 300 feet or do you have to go 800 feet? And then you have to make sure you have a well house. And by the time you add all of that up, they're saying, well, I can get the same house in town for X amount of dollars. And I said, yeah, but you're not building a development too. So it really struck them hard about the expense 
just to be able to build with just a construction road, which would be nothing but we just dump gravel all the yeah. way to where the job site was. So we can get materials back there if it's raining. We would have to put in a saw pole, which is the power. So all the, the power lines have to run in so they can drop us power. And we have to have water if we're going to pour concrete. We've got to have a well that's working, so I have to have power to it. And they would just freak out and just didn't understand that it is different when you dip, build mm-hmm. out in the country. You just don't plop a house there and say, look at me. Well, some people do, but (laughs) for the most part, you can't. Yeah. And by the way, that was one of the things we liked about this development was that you couldn't have a house with wheels under it. Um, Or delivered on wheels. (laughs) That's why. (laughs) Well, I don't know about that. I mean, it's. Yeah, I don't know either. Yeah. But I do know that the outbuilding, (laughs) the outbuilding has to be 20% smaller than the main structure. And the main structure has to be built first. And they have all these other protections really? out there, the way wow. it's done. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good deal. That The thing that we didn't notice when we first bought out there, that we've noticed now, is that everybody has this really robust fence around the edge of their property. Oh. To stop yeah. the feral hogs. I know why they're that's there. <laughs> yes, you will. And don't forget, you have to fence in all your property. Oh, it's just a little, you know, piglet. No, they're 850 pounds. <laughs> These things right. are and the they're size mean. of a Volkswagen. Right. Oh, and they're mean, and you can't stop them with a gun. <laughs> a no, big you gun, can, maybe. But you need a big one and a couple yeah, of bullets. So, in them. No, but it's and like, then what yeah. do you do with it? People say, well, I'll shoot them. What are you going to do? Let it lay out in the backyard? You have a tractor to drag that thing somewhere to bury Actually, it. Actually, <laughs> you cut the tail off and you go to the rangers and they pay you for it. Oh, they'll take it for you? They'll, no, they'll take the tail and they'll pay you for proof that you killed it. I know, and but you still have to drag an 800-pound animal off of your property. Know, and it's you not need a meat you want to eat. a tractor. No, okay. exactly. All right. Well, we, <laughs> okay, fine. I think we've the beaten tail, all the easy. meat off. I, Bob, <laughs> I hope we haven't discouraged you too much. But, you know, yeah, you don't gonna... eat... well, Charlie, let's face it. You've got rattlesnakes and you're rethinking yours. So that's the way it is. Right. I'm not rethinking it as much as I'm just uh, <laughs> rethinking it. Well, I like All to right. say this. When, when people move out in the country, you're moving out into the country. If you had monkeys in the forest, you're going to have them in your house. Uh, if you're in Brownsville, you're going to have tarantulas and scorpions. You move out in the country here, you're going to have snakes and you're going to have hogs. Don't think you can. If people from the city move out in the country. You're not going to have those kind of experiences. Althea is in yeah. Tomball. Speaking of out of the city, she says, I have a two car. Here's a big problem. I have a two no, car not anymore. garage, okay, a two door garage <laughs> with a center brick post that makes access difficult, meaning she can't quite aim into that little hole. Uh, I want to change the two door to a one door garage, but I'm concerned about the roof support structure and so on. Which home show pro would you suggest for this project? And do I need an insulated door in Tomball? You don't need an insulated door. This will be the quick part, and then I'll talk about the opening. The insulated door, if you want to, you can buy one. If you don't want to, you don't have to. If you're going to air condition the garage, then maybe, and you're going to insulate it and do other things in there. But no, I would say for you, chances are, whether you're in Tomball or you're in Galveston or even all the way to uh, Huntsville and so on. Insulated doors are only if you need them. And people don't realize the insulated door was developed for northern climates because I had a house in Lake Placid. We actually had to keep our garage heated to about 40 degrees so the car wouldn't freeze over. So I'd get the kids to school every day. So then I had to insulate a garage door because I had to keep the place heated. And that's where they were developed, what was developed for. And that's where they kind of migrated down to the south. Now, as far as that opening goes, depending how... Uh, intricate it is if it's simple which it probably isn't but i'm glad you asked the question somebody needs to look at it you could go either rudy's quality painting and rudy's carpenters could probably restructure the door or if it gets pretty intricate a trifection who does um, remodeling it could be more of a remodel project depending what's above it if you have plumbing electrical you, you've got to remodel that whole wall there to make sure that it can take the span of a second floor in other words, just not a couple rafters, but you actually have living space above. So one of those two, and you can you can have them each look at it and decide uh, who, who could take a, a, who could who could handle it. Now the third thing is is when you do the opening, you just take out the middle. That's not going to be a standard opening anymore for a off the shelf garage door. If they want to make it that way and they're siding on the outside, then one of those those companies can do that. If not, an overhead door company of Houston can make a custom length door 
for the opening that'll probably be a little bit bigger than a standard two-car garage, which is 16 feet. I feel Althea's pain because we have a two-car garage that Sandy mm-hmm. parks her little TT in, which is like, you know, you can't miss that hole. And then I've got a one-car garage that I back my car into. And if my car was this much wider, I'd need Crisco to get in and out of that garage. It is a precision operation getting the car in and out of there. So I don't blame her. True. No, no right. I would double garage doors, extra wide garage doors. If anybody mm-hmm. ever builds a home, you know, an eight-foot door is a standard garage door. You can buy an off-the-shelf nine-foot door and get that extra foot. So just if you want a single garage door and just have it a little bit bigger. So a lot of people don't realize that the expenses, the hole's a little bigger. The garage doors are probably 60 bucks more. It's not a big deal at all. Mm-hmm. Just plan ahead. Yeah, I think if if I was building that house, I would have done that. I would have made the, I would have got it custom down that one and made mine just a little bit wider because it's just, yeah. it's hard to get it out of there. I mean, it's just... Well, Charlie, you can call Rudy's Quality Painting or you can call Trifection and have the whole opening restructured and overhead door company will fit your door for you. <laughs> I'd love to, but we've already called Ideal Roofing and our vacations have been yeah, for the rest of the year. <laughs> okay. yeah, I, I, I foresee a home show video about a re- roof replacement project coming. I, I, I heard in the grapevine, yes. Yes, and it's like, and, and the shingles just went up. And in about three weeks, they're going up again. So if you're getting your roof done, you want to get it done now because they're they're not going cheaper. I don't know if you oh. know this, but there's petroleum in that product. And, <laughs> yes. so, and, I, don't, and that, I hear it's getting more expensive. So, all right. Third and by question. the way, you move yeah. things on a truck by weight. And so diesel fuel is going up too. Next question. <laughs> Judy in Jersey yeah. Village says, my house was built in the 1970s and has aluminum wiring. I have had electrical issues on and off for several years now. And the electrician told me that due to the age of the home, the aluminum wiring is probably starting to wear thin and fray and that I can expect to have these issues from now on. What's your advice on handling this, Tom? Well, I think the explanation of wearing thin and fray uh, makes no sense. Uh, if there is a, a problem with your aluminum wiring or any old wiring of, at all. Now, if, thin and fray would be something like knob and tube where they had a cloth wrapping on there. Aluminum wiring is just like a plastic coated or rubber, rubbery plastic coated uh, Romex of copper or aluminum. So it doesn't really get frayed or worn. It can overheat if it was undersized. And there was a few cases of that out originally when they started using aluminum wiring because it has to be bigger. But usually the problem with aluminum wiring is at the connections. And so if you're having connection problems, depending what your problems are, uh, call an electrician that will actually find out what the problem is and not that saying it's frayed and old and just giving you some kind of uh, sentence that doesn't make sense to rewire your house. Most electricians don't want to mess with aluminum wiring. They'd rather rewire your home. Licensed electricians are going to go down that route probably every time. But the true problem with aluminum wiring is the connection of the screw to the plugs and the switches. And that's where they would uh, overheat on those plugs. So there's a different plug you can buy if you want to. Kolar rated. It's CO slash ARL. It means compatible with aluminum. And uh, you could replace it if that's the problem you're having. Replace it with those. It's still going to be a lot of work and expensive. Uh, so you can talk to Right Touch Electrical if you want. But it has nothing to do with being frayed and uh, burned up. That just doesn't make sense. Wire is wire. If you're looking for pros you can trust, you go to homeshowradio.com, by the way, and scroll down. We've got all our home show pros arrayed there for your help. And if you don't know who, but you know what you need done, then we also have them organized by category. And that'll make life easier. You know, Tom, I remember back in the, I want to say the late 80s, about the 90s, back when we first started working together, that they had a process called Copaloom or something where they're pig Exactly. Copaloom. Yes. Yeah. What, whatever happened to that? What happened? The, the problem with that is, is they were, they had a system where they would take copper wire and they would pressure uh, connect it to the aluminum wire. So the copper was the connection on the, on the plugs or the switches because copper and the plugs were meant for copper, not for aluminum. Right. Uh, but what happened was, is a, a electrical box is only so big. And if you're doubling and tripling up the wire inside the box and then having to shove this thing in, it just makes a mess inside those boxes. So people just got away from it 
because it really was not helping them. It was making a different kind of problem of overstuffing the boxes. When they came out with it, and it was about the same time they came out with the plugs and switches that you just replaced, you just bought a new plug and put it in that was compatible with aluminum. It had a different type of screw on there, so it reacted to the aluminum better and didn't loosen up and cause a little spark. Uh, that was an easier solution, so everybody went to that. And quite frankly, aluminum wiring is still code approved in many areas, like your service runs, your 220 runs. When you buy lights from Home Depot and Lowe's, there's always aluminum wiring on the lights. It's still used all the time, and it, it's safe. If you remember in the 70s, you heard about all these fires because of aluminum wiring. It really wasn't because of aluminum wiring. What happened was Kaiser Aluminum, which, which started to produce the aluminum wiring, uh, they started, people started uh, suing about the aluminum wiring. And instead of fighting it in court and putting an end to it, they just started paying people off. So everybody started relating to the aluminum wiring and made a lot of money from Kaiser. Kaiser really shot themselves in the foot with trying to keep it quiet as opposed to saying it's really safe if used properly. And so that's why you don't hear of aluminum wire fires anymore. They don't exist because there's no money to be made from it. It doesn't happen. It's usually just a problem with the wiring if you have a fire. Yeah, because I, I would think that in that freight as much as the she's probably experiencing that the connections are, are becoming uh, the, the the wire is becoming looser in the fixtures and all that. And she's not and that could be good. That's gonna probably be, more what plug, she's she probably misunderstood the explanation, I would think. I hope so. It's just plugs and switches. But now she might have an it's an old house. She might have an old breaker box. And they're thinking, you know what, we should just rewire this whole thing because we're going to have to try mm -hmm. to get special breakers. And there's a whole big story behind what, old houses because it'll be more than just the wiring. It's usually the breaker panels that start to really cause people problems when they start to rewire. Well, the panels today, I mean, by I think national code have to have yeah. the uh, what do you call those? Um, not arc fault. What is it? Arc fault? The well, they have arc faults, but on the breakers, you're talking about the uh, uh, f for uh, power surges, the surge right. protectors. Surge protectors, they're right. Yeah, they're starting to require those. So every time somebody comes out with a new item, they start getting them in the code. It makes a lot of money for them. But at the same time, if it's code, it's code. And you have someone like a licensed electrician like Will come out. He's going to have to do it. He's a licensed electrician. He wants to make his license, keep his license in good, good standing. So they're going to do exactly what it says. And it's not going to hurt anybody. It just kind of raises a cost a little bit, but that's just the way it is. So skeptical, so cynical. Well, we lived without it for a hundred years. That's true. That's true. <laughs> Sorry. Somehow I rode a bike without a helmet my whole life and here I am. Where I know. And I don't have Hold one on. on my house. My house is great. So I don't yeah. know what to tell people. I know, but we have one now in those, I think, I think they're called arc fault breakers now aren't they that they put in there or something you have some arc sort faults of... now you have gfis uh, yeah. gfcis were the first ones and they came out with the arc faults for other applications then mm -hmm. you have the surge protectors all these things make it safer and safer but sometimes we have, it can we have all that in our new yeah we have all that in our new breaker or our new panel on the side yeah. of the house and those uh when those when those breakers start going it's you know, we we had one that kept going and it turned out that the breaker itself was bad and, uh, that happens and a lot. they came out and changed it for nothing. So. All right. That's good. Kevin is in Brazoria. You remember, Kevin, he's been working on his uh, house. Kevin's down. been a regular. Yes. I yes, know he Kevin. has. Oh, wait a second. We back. haven't gotten to Kevin. Actually, we're on Roger first. I got to help oh, myself. Well, Kevin, he's, you'll be getting there. Oh, yeah. Yes. Hang on, Kevin. Uh, Roger writes, I have two HVAC questions. I'm looking at purchasing an Armstrong three ton two stage gas condenser. I only need a two and a half ton unit, but with it being two stage, does that allow me to increase the tonnage sum for a future house addition? And how much square foot will 70,000 BTU gas horizontal furnace with 96 efficiency, 96 percent efficiency heat, Tom? That furnace will probably heat a church. Uh, our furnaces <laughs> are, are, are so oversized to what our needs are down here. Furnace is not going to be your issue. So let's hit with the air conditioner first, then I'll hit back on the furnace. Uh, can you go from a two and a half to three ton? Yeah. Would you go to a two and a half to five ton? No, that's pushing too big on on a for planning for an addition that's going to be really big. 
But if it's just a three ton or three and a half and somebody can tweak it a little bit, you're probably going to be just fine, even especially with a dual stage, which will run on a lower capacity for parts of the of the season, which gives you more dehumidification. That's why they do that. Now, as far as furnaces go, the furnace is part of the, of the blower motor. So the furnaces come standard and way too big that, for what we need in the Houston area. Uh, furnaces are meant to, to handle temperatures of 20 below zero, things like this, and keep your home comfortable. So if you want to relate BTU to uh, uh, tons, 12,000 BTUs is, is a, approximately one ton of cooling. So when you buy window units, you can kind of relate that. But the 70,000 BTUs is going to heat a lot for what our low temperatures would be in Houston. You won't ever find a need for any other any more heat. In fact, people complain a lot because uh, the, the furnaces in our part of the country heat so fast and are so uncomfortable because of the, the, the on and off of, of the heat going on and off and blowing the cold air through the ducts that uh, it's because they're oversized. And to make a furnace small and have an air conditioner big enough, it doesn't work because the fan blower won't blow enough air for the air conditioner. So now he's in Austin. It would same would go for him there, right? Yeah, we're not in Lake Placid, New York, or Chicago, or something like that. Okay. No, so All he's right. fine. All right, let's get to Kevin because we're almost out of time, and I want to get his question. All right, Kevin. And just yes. so you know, Kevin wrote one question, but it was like it was like War and Peace. It was like this long, <laughs> and so I broke it off, and we answer one question at a time. So you're welcome to send long ones. I understand we may have to break them up. So we get everybody's questions answered. So Kevin wrote to us. He says, as you remember, he's remodeling that 1965 concrete block home about seven yes. miles from the coast. Well, while I like exposed beams, he says, on the open-ended gable, I'm concerned it may not provide enough protection during blowing rain for ceiling fans and sitting under it. The porch faces east, so it'll be open to mostly southeasterly winds. Aesthetics aside, Tom, if you were building for ease of maintenance and practical usage, would you go with the open-ended or wall it up with hardy? Well, if you're going to sit out there and blowing rain, you're probably going to get wet, whether you have just the, that little triangle part uh, closed off or not. And if you like the open beams, and I've done a lot for a lot of people, I think they look great. If it's raining that hard, you're probably not going to be outside anyway. So I don't see it being an issue. I think it, it, when you're really out there enjoying beautiful weather and beautiful days, uh, then I think that if that's what you want, you can go ahead and have it. And you can extend the roof out a little bit if you want to. But I say either way is fine. You're going to get wet. And if it's weather's that bad on the coast, you're not going to be sitting outside anyway. Now, as far as ceiling fans and stuff go, you, you buy exterior ceiling fans. So they're in a waterproof box. Uh, they can actually get wet. I wouldn't soak them in water and turn them on at the same time, but they can get sprayed with, with water and, and lights, just like outdoor lights and everything else. You just use exterior fixtures and exterior fixture boxes and wiring techniques, and you'll be fine. All right, cool. So you decide whether you want to be out in the weather or not. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anybody's going to be out there if you're in a, you know, when, you know, when it rains sideways in Houston, most people, even the dogs come in. They don't want to go outside. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I was I was home alone uh, last weekend, and we had those big storms blow through Houston last weekend. And I woke up in the middle of the night with all three dogs in my bed. Sandy was traveling. Yeah. She was our our stepson's getting married here in a couple of weeks. That's why after the week after next, we won't be on because I'll actually be at his wedding while this is going on, so we won't be able to do it. But was this um, Saturday night? Thursday. Thursday night. Thursday wedding, yeah, and um, no, no, yeah. I said the the rain when it hit. Oh, this, the dogs, yeah, it came through Saturday night. The bottom line is Sandy wasn't there, so the dogs came and jumped yeah. in the bed, and I lay, I laid there for a moment or two, thinking, you know, I'm just, they can just stay here. I'm going back to sleep, and they started shifting around. It's like, nope, they got to go. So even the dogs <laughs> don't like that weather, but hey, you? Uh, you you were a lucky man. You know what I was doing Saturday night? I was sitting at George Bush National or State Park. Oh, I was yeah. under a poncho, sitting in a chair. <laughs> And having to sit all night long with the field training exercises with the Texas State Guard. We weren't allowed to go in. Lightning, thunder, we were out there just sitting through it all the whole time. And a whole bunch of us were pretty miserable for about six hours. So you were one lucky guy. I would have hugged those dogs all night long. 
I forgot about that's right. Yeah, you why do you think we weather. had a tape show last weekend? I was in that weather and I was <laughs> hiking 10 uh, miles of, of uh, rock pack hiking the day. And then that night I had to sit sleeping in a chair in my poncho. So Tom will be inside this Saturday <laughs> yes. doing his show, yes. right, Tom? Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, dry. So go ahead, tell him about the show. Oh, yes. No, I'm, this, I'm thinking about Saturday night that's sleeping. A, that's, that's gonna be so I was wonderful. trying for a seamless segue to a close here. Is what yeah, I'm that doing. didn't work. Yeah. Okay, well, make sure this Saturday, listen to me dry in my house right here in this exact chair. I'll be doing home show radio. I will not be in uniform. I will be on Monday, but not in on Saturday or Sunday. And I'll be doing the show 9 to 12 on Saturday, 8 to 11 on Sunday. And we will have the garden pros. And the gardens love the rain. And they will be coming on from 7 to 9, although those people have enough sense to come in out of the rain, too. Just not me. And if you have questions, you can send them to us at homeshowradio.com. Click the Ask Tom button. It'll take you to this page. Fill it out. Send it in. We'll take care of you. And, of course, here, let's change places. If you're looking for help around the house, you can count on our Home Show Pros. You'll find all of them at homeshowradio.com, either by name or by category. They're there to help you. We will be back again next Thursday at uh, 4 o'clock Central to do this or anytime your heart desires because this thing will be on YouTube for forever along with hundreds of Tom's Ask Tom videos where he answers questions that you send in and we post them every week, uh, every day rather, uh, here on YouTube and at our website at homeshowradio.com. So we will see you next Thursday. Got a question? Ask Tom on Home Show. from a pro who